You mentioned two words, purpose and presence, and I think they're actually very much connected. You know, like we have books in the world like The Power of Now, because people find it so difficult just to be present in the moment. And what the ancient teachers explain is that one of the reasons why we can't be present is because we haven't found purpose. When our uh, present is almost an anti-climax, when it doesn't resonate with our heart, when it's not exciting, enthusing, enthralling enough, then naturally we gravitate to the past or the future. But what the ancient teachers explain is that when we're situated in our purpose and we're living according to our potential, then it's so exciting that we're naturally present. And so there's almost a connection between purpose and presence. S.P. Keshava Swami, <laughs> welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Petra. It's real uh, honor to be here and uh, happy to have this conversation today. Yeah, thank you, because I know um, it's a, I feel like it's a real privilege to have this one-on-one -on -one time with you. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, and already instantly, I know we just spoke, I just feel more relaxed already, just kind of sitting here in front of you. Um, so I think it really does speak true to the kind of energy field that people have around each other as well. And um, you emanate such a positive sort of energy um, and I feel peaceful. And so I kind of wanted to start with that because I've spoken about energy a lot in the podcast before and um, how we can kind of tap into each other's um, feelings and energy. Um, do you, you, you know, you've led this monastic life now for quite a while. Is that something that comes naturally to you to kind of tap into that and, and kind of feel what others are feeling around you as well? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I also feel very uh, natural in these situations. It's, it's actually said in Eastern spirituality to be in contact with the earth um, is a very beautiful thing. In India today, you'll also find that people just walk barefoot mm -hmm. everywhere because it said that by being in contact with the minerals and the energy and the, yeah, the just, ju just the substance of the earth has a very powerful effect on one's consciousness. And nowadays we don't walk or contact the earth actually, we're either flying in planes or riding in cars. And if we are walking, we're walking with, uh, with shoes on, with sketches on. <laughs> <laughs> shout um, out. <laughs> yeah, shout out there. Um, so yeah, it's just nice to be sitting on the ground and uh, even though we are in a building, but, um, and yeah, the energy around us creating a habitat. When I became a monk at the age of 21 and I joined the monastery, then one of the first things we were taught is the power of the environment and the energies around us. In the ancient book uh, called the Bhagavad Gita, uh, Krishna, the speaker, explains that um, our surroundings are pervaded by three types of energy. Um, one type of energy is known as a kind of, um, a kind of covering energy, an ignorant energy. And then another type of energy is a passionate or a creative energy. And another one is a, a goodness energy, a kind of illuminating energy. And everything we interact with in the world can be affected by any one or a combination of these three. And so when we um, kind of uh, optimize our diet, when we optimize our living space, when we optimize the times of day in which we function, then we begin to create a certain energy around us that then creates an energy within us. And um, it's a very powerful science. Yeah. yeah, you can feel it when you walk in a room sometimes. And I think we just, we follow logic a lot. We follow our mind and brain and that has its place too. But we just don't, I think tap into our body enough and we we just don't listen to it and I think it has so much wisdom um and I'm sure that because you've kind of dedicated your a lot of your time into into looking into not only your mind but body and spirit as well um it's a practice that probably comes more natural so when when you don't have time or maybe you've not 
you're not able to ha- to dedicate as much time as you would like to to that what kind of um nuggets of wisdom do you have for people that, that they can do to to tap into their body yeah <clears throat> i usually share with people um four really important things that they can change about their environment that will create almost an instantaneous and immediate change in their kind of conscious state um the first one i share with people is um rise before the sun uh the time you get up in the morning that's something yeah, i that, do not do i started with the hardest one <laughs> yeah. um because when we start the day with intention when we start the day by balancing the inner world before we enter the external world then it means we come out into this world um with us almost a protection around us because we've fortified our own consciousness mm. and so um the first kind of basic habit is just um rising before the sun or rising with the sun and having some intention before you get into the madness of daily life um the second habit i share with people is diet and what we kind of put into our body of course we know the old adage that you are what you eat but just eating um fresh food eating healthy food eating food which hasn't um you know kind of caused any violence and trying to eat that food at regulated times and also eat that food in a very conscious way and if you think about those four or five tips on diet um if we were just able to follow that we'd actually see a huge effect in our consciousness so the energy that is created by your diet is the second thing i think the third thing i share with people is the people around them um we're so much a combination of the energies of the people who we allow into our lives and of course some of it we don't have a a choice over we work with certain people we're on the tube with certain people we can't make a choice but we do have a choice over who we choose to spend our time with and 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 allow into our life in a in a more intimate way and so if we're really conscious about that then um that habit or that lifestyle choice has a huge effect on our mm-hmm. energy and i would say the fourth thing i share with people um that can have a huge effect on um uh your consciousness and your energy is um the amount of clutter in your life and um we have this kind of concept of simple living high thinking um and the power of just decluttering your environment and how that declutters your mind and when i talk to people about decluttering it could be anything from decluttering your phone and all the apps unnecessary apps that are there it could be decluttering your desk at work it could be decluttering your car it could be decluttering your wardrobe it could be um any of these things you know just creating room um like we're in quite a nice room here and and it's not cluttered and it immediately you can feel that energy so so yeah i guess those are the kind of four habits your your sleeping time your um diet your company and um the declutter that you can it's making me feel already better thinking about decluttering mm-hmm. and yeah it it is what i was saying it, it just gives that space for you to dedicate a bit more time to just you and focusing on you so so how do you eat consciously Yeah that's a really uh that's a really good one. Um well I think the first thing is when we eat we number one we don't multitask. Nowadays uh people eat and watch TV or they eat and they have like a really deep conversation mm-hmm. with someone or they eat and they um kind of answer their emails at the same time. And one of the most basic things that is given in spiritual culture about eating is just eat um and don't do anything else and just give your full concentration to the task because you know it's probably one of the most important things you do in the day because it's where you energize and refuel your body so the first thing is uh do it as a single task don't multitask 
The second thing is um, eating consciously means to chew. <laughs> it sounds so it sounds so crazy, but it said that unless you actually chew the food a certain amount of times, you don't actually get the full benefit um, of of what you're actually ingesting, and so to to kind of chew multiple times. Um, the third thing that's given is an interesting one in actually Eastern culture. It said that you should actually eat with your hands, mm. um, which uh, which you still see to this day in ancient. So, the idea of touching your food and feeling its texture mm. um, actually is said to immediately before you even put it in your mouth, it immediately begins to get certain enzymes and things in your body moving. So um, interesting. Yeah, so you'll find that you know, you'll see the monks definitely they 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 eat with their. Yeah, with their I've got quite a funny story on that actually because my so I'm my father's from the Middle East and we oh. definitely you know people from the Middle East eat with their hands quite a lot. Yeah. And um, my brother-in-law invited a kind of neighbour over and they had this big fish on the barbecue and with rice and he started to kind of open it up with his hands and the poor lady was just completely mortified looking at it <laughs> but you're right it's just getting back to nature again isn't it and just yeah. being a bit more um you know connected to the things around you even yeah. if it's food or people or whatever yeah. that is so going back to um the kind of monastic path and being a monk i guess that follows a lot of stereotypes that people might have um about the word monk but what what does being a monk mean and um second question to that is um when did you know that this was your purpose in life yeah thank you so much the first interesting thing is that people think of monastic life as a lifelong commitment whereas in the ancient eastern culture monastic life was actually something that everyone did for a period of their life some people were monks for a week, for a month, for a year, some for 10. And then after taking that period of monastic training, they would then go out into the world and, uh, and do amazing things, um, but with those principles embedded within them. So um, the idea of spending some time in a monastery or what we call in Sanskrit an ashram, is that um, in order to really find ourselves, in order to really hear the inner calling, in order to get in touch with um, a deeper sense of self-awareness, it's so important just to step away from our normal environment. Sometimes in life, we're surrounded by so many um, voices, the voices of other people's opinions, the voices of society's trends, the voices of the media, which tells you what success is. And in the midst of hearing and being bombarded by all those voices, we never hear our inner calling. Um, and then later on, we pursue a life um, of goals. Um, and sometimes we achieve those goals and we realize, but they weren't actually my herself with their divine connection and understand their purpose and so at the age of 21 after graduating from university I felt like that's what I had to do um, here what here I was as a 21 year old I had a degree in computer science and management I had a job at a, you know a prestigious company lined up in London and uh, I just felt the need to step away from it all just to make sure that this was actually my path. And so at 21, I went to India and it was an amazing experience. We lived in different ashrams. We contacted different, very saintly people. And most of all, it just gave me an opportunity to be in a different environment. Um, we'd wake up very early, we'd sleep on the floor. All our possessions would fit into a locker and um, and we'd spend our days meditating, um, studying spiritual wisdom, and uh, and really chalking out um, a vision for our lives. So it was a, a yeah an amazing time. And and I said most people um, usually spend a period of their life as a monk, 
But for me, it became such a calling um, that I decided to take lifelong vows of monasticism. So, yeah, I, I decided to embrace the path of lifelong re renunciation and um, monasticism. Um, so, yeah, that's something, I guess. Yeah. Um, to spiritual spirituality but I guess from an um, outsider's point of view that's quite a selfless thing to do um, but also on the flip side I imagine also very um, fulfilling because it must bring so much joy to yourself as well being able to just focus on um, your inner self and then a being able to help other people with that. Do you, do you grieve your old life and old old self? Um, I don't think I ever look back at any period mm. of my life and feel like um, disappointed or feel like I want to transport myself back to that. I, I think I've appreciated all periods of my life, even the period of my life before monastic life, um, because I think every period of my life gave me certain gifts and I feel like where I am now is where I want to be. And probably 10 years, 15 years from now, I'll be in a different place. And I, I hope that will be the place I want to be. I, th I think it's just a, an evolution that continues getting better and better, hopefully. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's a super fulfilling life. Um, people in today's day and age, they have so many things that... Um, they're struggling with and that if they're able to work through they could achieve incredible and amazing things in their life in the world we're living in today for example the mind is something that everyone's battling with and um, from what I've learned in the monastery and through these spiritual teachings I've just seen the power that they have in and in helping people um, deal with their daily struggles and so, yeah, we go into all kinds of forums. We just came back from the United States. And in 30 days, we did like 80 events. Wow. Um, and we went to corporate firms. We did like Intel, Google, Apple. We went to um, universities, Princeton, Stanford, NYU, Berkeley, many. We went to government organizations. And it's just so incredible to see how ancient wisdom is so versatile and powerful in addressing just the needs of people today. How do you find that people are kind of receiving that information and especially in the corporate world and not just the US but in general? Um, I know that some of these spiritual teachings can be to a lot of people who aren't maybe well versed in some of it um, can can be a bit they could say woo woo, yeah. um, which is just a bit too out there or far fetched. Yeah. So, Lofty, what's the yeah. Yeah. yeah? What's the vibe? Like, what vibe are you getting? Yeah, I think in the world we're living in today, people are a little bit standoffish about religion. Mm -hmm. We turn on the news every day, and, and we see um, the potentiality that religion has sometimes to cause conflict, to cause division, to cause animosity and aggression. Um, but I think the interesting thing is people are, I think, more than ever open to spirituality, the idea that there is something be knowledge, which, as you said, sometimes feels to be a little out there, very lofty, very otherworldly, um, very philosophical and theological and take all of that knowledge and kind of break it down for people in such a way that if they want to learn like how to make good decisions or if they want to learn how to find love or if they want to know how to avoid burnout or if they want to learn how to find their purpose then they can draw all of that from spiritual teachings mm -hmm. um ian uh, ivan pavlov yeah ivan pavlov he says if you want to find a new idea, go to an old book. And so there's a sense in which whenever I read the ancient scriptures, I'm like, wow, this is what everyone's looking for. Um, but it just has to be brought to people um, in a relevant way. Yeah. 
So with the ancient scriptures, so um, I mean, it's something that's fairly new to me in terms of the Vedas and the Bhagavad Gita that you mention, and your book, um, Tattva 2, as well, which I will link. Yeah. Um, so with those, I guess what I'm trying to say is, you hear a lot of opinions these days, you know, we've got social media, we have the media, like you said earlier, that are just kind of bombarding us with the different things. And then we have these ancient scriptures. And we also have some spiritual teachers that have written books, but then have also said later on, or have evolved in their kind of um, way of thinking as well. So how important is it, I guess, to stick to those ancient scriptures? And how do we know what is true and what to what to follow in this day? It's quite a hard question yeah, probably, but no, it's something no, that's... It's a, it's yeah. really, what impressed me when I came to the monks who were teaching the Bhagavad Gita is that they presented the Bhagavad Gita as a spiritual science. Now, for me, that was somewhat of a revelation because I had almost in my mind created a, a somewhat of an aggressive demarcation between science and spirituality. Mm -hmm. And here was the monk who was telling me that, no, this is a spiritual science. And I said, but how can spirituality be scientific? And he said, well, science means there's a hypothesis, there's an experiment, and then there's a conclusion. So he said, all we're asking you to do is take these um, nuggets of wisdom, these spiritual worldviews, and just kind of implement it in your life. Meditate, wake up early, you know, study this wisdom, introspect on it, adjust certain aspects of your life, and see whether it triggers any kind of higher consciousness. And then he said, you'll know for yourself whether it actually works, because the truth is ultimately what works. And so I kind of began to approach the Bhagavad Gita in that way. Not that I was almost just pouring all of my faith into this blindly and then kind of just keeping my fingers crossed that, you know, it would come out good at some point. But to just approach it in, a, in the mood of let's give it a go as a spiritual scientist. And so um, I guess that's how I've always approached spirituality and I guess that's how I present it to people as well. It's interesting that at the end of the Bhagavad Gita, the, as you know, it's a conversation between Krishna and Arjuna, who's like a warrior asking many questions. And after delivering all the wisdom of the Bhagavad Gita, at the end of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna looks at Arjuna and he says, I've given you all the knowledge. Now think about it, challenge it, reflect on it, introspect and then do what you want to do. Mm. In other words, he just asks Arjun to kind of use his own faculty of discrimination and become a spiritual scientist. And so when I share spiritual knowledge with the people, the Vedas, the Bhagavad Gita, I don't share it so much in the mood of uh, this is an ancient theology which you have to have faith in, which you have to believe but I just share it more in the spirit sense of a spiritual science that it has tools for you that can empower you on every level, physically, emotionally, spiritually. Give it a try. Yeah, it's important to know that it's not just doctrine and it's yeah. something that can be interpreted and, um, yeah, kind of... And applied. And yeah. applied, yeah. yeah. And like you said, if it works for you, if you see that the quality of your life or the quality of people around you are, is high and, and works for you, then you know that it's working and so it means that we don't have to take everything that people say or that is written as word but it's it's there for us and if we want to take you know different sections of it and apply them um, and see if that works then we have the kind of liberty to do yeah. that I guess yeah. yeah I think it's um I think there's this some kind of this fear amongst people that as you approach a spiritual tradition, you have to give up your intelligence, you have to give up your kind of questioning mm -hmm. capacity, and you just kind of have to just become very submissive. And um, I think it's actually the complete opposite, that coming to a spiritual literature and a spiritual tradition is meant to empower you to question more, to challenge more, um, yeah, it's almost like, it, yeah, it, it should actually create an inquisitiveness mm. within you more. 
yeah build yeah, that curiosity yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. definitely yeah, yeah. so do you work with um children do you work in it's one of those things where I have the world on my shoulders and I'm thinking how can I just solve suffering and even though I know suffering is necessary and I guess we can talk to that as well but with I think the kind of thing it always boils down to is the next generation um so yeah implementing that into education and schools I think is so important but I know we probably have a long way to go but what are your thoughts on that yeah, hundred percent. I really agree with you. Um, you know, sometimes rather than fixing the old, um, it's just better to create the new. And uh, that's not to say that we shouldn't try to solve the problems that are around us now. But really, the most progressive thing we can do is to work with a new generation and to create unity, harmony, to create understanding and uh, appreciation amongst that generation. And so, yeah, I think working with children is amazing. Um, I just came back from Ghana, actually. I was in West Africa. And in Accra, we actually have a school there for uh, 200 children. Um, you know, spending some time with them. And uh, you actually see that um, children have an incredible capacity to absorb knowledge. And because children haven't yet been bombarded by... Um, a kind of stereotypical image or um, kind of like, a, yeah, judgments of others. Um, they can kind of see things quite innocently. And if they're empowered with spiritual knowledge from a young age, then you can see how more individuals like that in the world will actually create a lot more harmony. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we have schools in our communities. That's a huge thing. And what we're also trying to do is bring like books like the Bhagavad Gita um, as one of our part of one of our projects here, Think Gita, uh, where we run courses on the Bhagavad Gita. We're actually uh, producing a book uh, for the children on the Bhagavad wow. Gita yeah. so that they can begin, um, yeah, absorbing some of that spiritual wisdom um, from a young age and, and really becoming uh, change makers in the world, conscious change makers. Yeah. And giving them that space to kind of think differently and yeah. and not just be conditioned as we, you know, so often are when we're just programmed from us, you know, from day dot to, you know, the age of seven where we're kind of developing that subconscious and um, it, yeah, it gives them that, um, you know, space to uh, be curious and then apply it if they want to later down the line, I guess. And yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a hard one because the, these days, you know, we still have a very old curriculum in, in schools. Um, and I just don't know when, I mean, I'm quite far removed. I don't have children yet, so I don't necessarily see that day to day. Um, and the media, yeah, you know, dominating our lives, basically. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I really... Um, yeah, resonate with what you're saying. I think the modern educational system sometimes tells us what to think instead of teaching us how to think. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, especially my years through like school and even university, I felt like I wasn't really being taught how to think. I was just kind of memorizing and kind of just... Um, yeah, just kind of packing in information. And I don't know how much, how transformative it was. And so, yeah, to really um, have children be able to look at things um, critically um, and, and consciously, I think is powerful, yeah. Mm. Yeah, presence is so powerful. It's something I, um, you know, read daily now on a, in, in any spiritual book. It's about being in the now, being in the moment. And a lot of people say that now. And I think there is a shift in consciousness that's happening, even though we are seeing so much pain still and suffering. I do believe that there's a kind of shift in the way that we, we use language these days as well. Um, a lot of things I read are about primary purpose which is more to do with 
being present and your primary purpose in life is to, um, yeah, go inwards basically and and uh, tap into that um, inner wisdom and presence. And I guess the secondary purpose is is of that of you and your personality and the, the fact that we still need to, you know, function in this world in physical yeah. form. And there are so many things that come with it that, you know, that are enjoyable as well. There are some material things that I guess are enjoyable and that we can kind of benefit from. Um, But for someone who really wants to know their purpose in life, more in terms of not primary purpose, because I believe that that is really just being present and, and, you know, being in the moment. But the secondary purpose of someone who has to still function in this world, what advice would you give people to find that purpose? Yeah, finding purpose is such a huge uh, topic. Today we've been talking a little bit about the Bhagavad Gita. And one of the words that appears in the Bhagavad Gita uh, again and again is Dharma. D-H-A-R-M-A. Dharma. And uh, it's actually said that the very first syllable of the Bhagavad Gita is D-H-R. And uh, the very last syllable of the Bhagavad Gita is M.A. And it said that the whole conversation is encapsulated Mm -hmm. to talk about Dharma, which literally means meaning or purpose or one's uh, calling in life. Um, Just to backtrack, you, you mentioned two words, purpose and presence. And I think they're actually very much connected. You know, like we have books in the world like The Power of Now because people find it so difficult just to be present in the moment. And what the ancient teachers explain is that one of the reasons why we can't be present is because we haven't found purpose. When our uh, present is almost an anticlimax, when it doesn't resonate with our heart, when it's not exciting, enthusing, enthralling enough, then naturally we gravitate to the past or the future. But what the ancient teachers explain is that when we're situated in our purpose and we're living according to our potential, then it's so exciting that we're naturally present. And so there's almost a connection between purpose and presence. And finding purpose is a a huge topic. Books and books have been written on it. Um, And I guess drawing from uh, Far Eastern ideas and and also the the ideas of the Bhagavad Gita, the best way I've heard it explained is basically if you imagine there are four circles. In one circle, it's what you're good at. In another circle, it's what you're naturally interested in and attracted to. In the third circle is the things which can earn you a living. And in the fourth circle, it's a a contribution you can make to society. And it's almost like the intersection of all of those four things is your purpose. So if tomorrow you can find a job that you're good at, that, um, that you're attracted to, that earns you the money you need to survive in the world and which, through which you can make an incredible contribution to the world, to people's lives, then you found your dharma. Mm. And, um, and finding that dharma or that purpose, I guess, is not an overnight thing. And I think uh, you can't also figure it out in your head. I think we just need to become more self-aware, look at our strengths, weaknesses, try to honestly see what we're wired for. And then just go out there in the world and try different things Mm. um, and constantly be looking to always move closer to your purpose. Because what happens is often people sell out for comfort and security, even when they know they haven't found their purpose. They'll stay in a job because it gives them comfort and security, but it's not really moving their heart. And so to have that bravery to keep moving out of your comfort zone to try to find your purpose, I think is super important. Yeah, there's definitely an element of going out of your comfort zone yeah. to begin with. And sometimes I wonder what what society would actually look like if we all were, you know, kind of reaching for our dharma. Because if we're all trying to be this kind of more aware, you know, person, then 
what about the the jobs that maybe people don't really want to do but that some people do that we need for society to function and I guess it's still a materialistic society um, and there's a lot of ego in it so I, I'm wondering whether if we're all kind of aiming that way it, it would just reshape society's landscape yeah That's a really, really good point. Um, There's a social body and there are different things Mm -hmm. which are needed in the world and we all have our individual callings and how do those two things kind of integrate. But it's actually said that by nature's arrangement, um, it's almost like you have an ecosystem and in an ecosystem, by nature's arrangement, there's enough of every species to kind of balance the whole thing. If we would actually leave it, Um, leave it to its natural course Um, it's amazing how there's enough of each species to kind of create the whole cycle so it goes on and similarly it's explained even within human society because we are all very individual it's not that everyone wants to be um, you know the top of the corporate ladder Um, Some people are just very content with having a much more simple and steady and Um, yeah, kind of uh, regulated life and they don't need to necessarily be um, the top of the success ladder. And and that's also success in itself, you know, just to be in a natural state. And so I think another problem in the world today is we've we've equated success with getting to the top Um, and therefore everyone's striving for the top. Um, But success is actually just to do what you're meant to do. Like uh, Einstein says, everyone's a genius. But if you convince a fish that it has to climb a tree, it will live its whole life thinking it's a failure. Mm. And so we unnecessarily put pressure on people to be something they're not. So I think if people would actually follow their dharma, then I think by nature's arrangement, it it would actually make society a lot smoother. Um, because people would be doing what they're really meant to be doing. Yeah, we we like to control things, don't we? So there's an element of letting go, I think. Um, And that leads me nicely to the topic of destiny, because that's something that is quite quite a mysterious thing that people still don't really, well, I'm, I'm definitely battling with in terms of, you know, when we're born, is this life already written out for us is it laid out and you know everything that we're you know you hear that thing where people say oh if it's meant to be it's meant to be Mm -hmm. um or are we kind of you know there's that law of attraction um topic that we can touch on that says actually no you you attract things or you can manifest things so what are your thoughts on the kind of is uh, is life predestined or um, can we and do we have the power to, you know, manifest the things that we desire? Mm, yeah, fascinating subject. <laughs> I <laughs> could have funny. another podcast yeah, just we could on have that. Another yeah. podcast on this. I was just at Stanford University, mm. actually, um, as I was mentioning in the US, and, and this was the very topic. Right. Um, we were talking about the secret, the power of attraction, yeah. the law of attraction mm. and uh, fate and free will. Um, let's see if in a couple of minutes I can (laughs) summarize everything we talked about. We talked there about how if you imagine there's a line, um, a continuum, and on one side we have fate, and on another side we have free will. And on this side we say people have complete um, power, their consciousness creates the reality, and they have a complete free will to manifest whatever they want. And on this side, the continuum is the idea that, as you said, it is what it is. Um, Whatever you're destined to get is all karma, is all predestined. Um, Where would we be on that continuum? According to the Bhagavad Gita, uh, somewhere in the middle. Life is an interplay of fate and free will. If we didn't have free will, it would just mean we're kind of robotic entities, almost like cogs in the machine, no sentience, no influence. And clearly uh, that wouldn't really tally with what we see in the world today. We see that our consciousness, our desires, our efforts have an effect on our future. And so the Bhagavad Gita says we do indeed have free will. We do indeed have some power to attract, to manifest things. Um, But the Bhagavad Gita says there is also an element of fate. 
that we come into this life um, with a certain karmic configuration. And so naturally some people will have more opportunity to become wealthy or powerful. Or some people come into this world with certain abilities innate. Um, and therefore um, there's a certain amount of predestiny as well. So according to the Bhagavad Gita, can we uh, manifest our future? Yes, but we're not um, the sole architects of our future. So life is an interplay of fate and free will. So if you imagine that um, by your previous activities, you're now acting on a certain stage that's being created by your past activities, and that stage is the karma that you're experiencing right now. But on that stage of your, of your karma, you have the um, free will to act how you want to act and dance how you want to dance. And, and that will create your next stage. And so life is an interplay of fate and free will. Mm. I don't know if that's... Yeah, that so mean? karma is like the foundation of it's life. It's creating the it's, context it's creating for you. that context. Yeah. And yeah. then you can kind of play it out exactly um, through it um so with i mean i'm sure there are some people that um karma is fairly new to i mean you you hear it again it's one of those things yeah. where it's like, oh what goes around comes around we always kind of add these kind of um sayings into life don't we and we say it and we maybe don't know really what we're saying yeah. so like what goes around comes around but karma is so interesting to me too yeah. can you talk a little bit more about karma and what it what it is yeah, karma uh, is interesting. Technically, the word karma can be used in different ways. Karma in one sense means an activity. So when you do karma, you're doing an activity. Karma can also be used in the context of a reaction. Um, so, you know, I'm getting my karma or a, a reaction that you're getting according to what you've done previously. But most popularly, when we kind of use the word karma, we're talking about the law which connects those two things. So as you mentioned, the law of karma is the idea that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Um, even in science, there's a scientific law. Mm. Um, so uh, where does that law come from? So according to the Bhagavad Gita, the way that divinity sets up this world is that this world is actually meant to be almost like a cosmic university. It's a place where we come to learn lessons about who we are, about where happiness lies and about what our ultimate purpose is. And so the whole purpose of this world is actually educational to raise our consciousness. Mm -hmm. And... Um, one of the ways in which we raise our consciousness is by going through the law of karma. So in other words, and it's more complicated than this, but just for the purpose mm -hmm. of understanding, um, you do a good action and you get a good reaction because what it is is the universe telling you or reinforcing that good mentality that you have. And you do a bad action, you get a bad reaction which is the universe's way of telling you that you have to change the way you're interacting. And so the idea of karma is it's an educational law by which we receive certain experiences in our life in order to elevate our consciousness towards a better way of living. And so it's an incredibly profound insight because what it means is that nothing in your life is happening by chance. Um, I've lost my job, I'm going through a relationship difficulty, I'm experiencing a health challenge. Um, the spiritualist in all of those situations is able to detach themselves from the immediate emotions and ask themselves, uh, what am I supposed to learn from this? Mm -hmm. Because it's not happening by chance. Yeah, there's that surrender element to it where we surrender to things and somehow everything just becomes easier when you detach and even when you are trying to manifest and again that's a cliche word now in a way but when you're 
in manifesting certain desires, I think that um, what I've found is when you detach from the outcome of that is generally when it works and when it happens. And that's the, um, the letting go and the control. Um, but following that with other people, then there's a quote from Jean-Paul Sartre that says, hell is other people. Um, <laughs> not very nice. Um, but, um, you know, other people are in our lives. Um, we have family, friends, just general pe- people that we come across. Um, they, you know, they impact us in certain ways. So tying into that kind of destiny, are we just to accept what other people do? Or should we also, you know, stand up for ourselves and rather than just saying, oh, if that was meant to be, that's meant to be. But should we have that voice and still stand up for ourselves? And that's in our personal lives. But also when you look at conflict, as you mentioned earlier, and what's going on in the world right now and has been for, you know, centuries, um, you know, is is it important to still um, fight for justice? Yeah, that's a yeah, really deep question. <laughs> I think when we're interacting with others, um, the spiritualist has two responses. Um, a practical external response and a reflective internal response. I'll kind of explain what I mean. Say, for example, here I am in London and someone else is launching a barrage of negativity towards me. Then what I understand as a spiritualist uh, or what I'll do as a spiritualist is immediately on an external level have a practical kind of external response, which is I'll protect myself. I'll try to, yeah, to some extent, create some justice there to try to explain to that person in whichever way I can that the way they're acting is not acceptable. So that's my practical response to it. But a spiritualist also has a reflective internal response where they simultaneously understand I needed to go through that. That this person um, is a messenger of my karma that this person is delivering me an experience that uh, I needed to go through in order to uplift my consciousness. And so it's almost like this dual thing is going on where you um, understand I needed to receive that, but at the same time, uh, you do make a practical adjustment to kind of mitigate this situation. And so I think both things have to be there. If we only do the practical external, um, then we miss out on the internal evolution Mm -hmm. that comes from it. And if we only try to do the internal without addressing the situation, we might find ourselves becoming so overwhelmed by that that we can't do the internal. So I think both things have to go hand in hand. Yeah, no, I agree. That's really resonated with me. There's definitely a duality to it. And there's taking action, but then there's taking action with awareness behind it, I guess. And that has such a different impact and outcome, most likely as well. Yeah, Um, yeah, so interesting. So um, I guess I want to finish off a bit on the topic of, of love because everyone talks about it. Um, It's, you know, in our face all the time and we're looking for it. Um, A lot of people are. um, And it's always on the media, TV. And what is love? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I, I, you know, I travel the world and uh, I remember one day I was out in in an exhibition somewhere on a table, like, yeah, speaking to people about spiritual things. So I decided for the whole day, Every single person I stopped, I'd ask them, um, can you define love mm. for me? Because we use it as such, like, so loosely. And I was shocked that in the whole day, like, hardly anyone could give me a, a deep um, definition of love. Um, according to the ancient Eastern teachers, the, the, the kind of, uh, the way to explain love or understand love is uh, a completely selfless offering of oneself to another. That is what love is. To give without expectation, to serve without um, any ulterior motive, to um, 
innately desire the um, the well-being and the upliftment of the object of your love and um, and in that way when the eastern teachers approach the topic of love um, they approach it in a different way not so much that we either love someone or love someone or we don't love someone but rather we can see it more as like the unfolding of love that in a relationship there can be an unfolding of love as the selfless spirit to want to sacrifice to serve that person um, becomes more and more prominent and what we find in the world today is that people often um, mistake lust for love and so they equate love with chemistry or with attraction or with physical um, kind of gratification whereas actually love is something much beyond that layer. We tell people that chemistry may bring two people together, but commitment is what will really manifest love in that relationship. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's, it's very much a, a selfless giving, which is the foundation of love. Mm. I always wonder what, when, when you say chemistry, I wonder what makes you attracted or what it is that, that you know, you, you're attracted to f from a specific person and not another. Like, why is there that chemistry that brings those two people together where love can potentially grow, but maybe not for another two people? That's where I'm always a bit... Yeah. Well, I guess on. physical attraction is definitely there. Yeah. Um, and then I think sometimes on an emotional level... Mm people gravitate towards those who they feel can fill a void within themselves. Mm. And therefore we kind of are drawn towards people who make us feel more complete. Mm. Um, so I guess there could be different triggers which kind of bring two people together, very interesting. But yeah, but it's really what happens in that relationship once they are together. Um, mm. And it's interesting, I think, in the world today, we often talk about love and, and, and we really center it around romantic love, mm. like between um, partners. But actually, love is meant to pervade all relationships, you know, whether it's parent and child, whether it's student and teacher, whether it's friends. Um, uh, yeah, it's uh, it, because it's that selflessness in the relationship which brings love. Yeah, yeah. I think it's recognising, I mean, we're all, I believe that we're all made up of the same thing inside. So it's almost recognising that inner essence of someone in another person, sorry. So recognising what your inner essence is in the other person. And then that's true love then, because that's just true connection. Yeah, yeah, and the Bhagavad Gita talks about how we almost have three aspects to our identity. So we have a physical aspect, and then we have a subtle aspect, which is our mind, our intelligence, and so on. But the Bhagavad Gita says beyond that, the first identity, the first self, is that we're spiritual beings, mm -hmm. we're sparks of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like a little bit of a mystical thing. Most people have never really thought like, what is a soul? How do I interact with someone as a soul? But that inner essence mm -hmm. and exploring and connecting on that level is what really gives substance to a relationship. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, so what's your, I guess, lasting message to the listeners if you had to give one? Um, well, there could be many. <laughs> <laughs> With, I guess with, uh, with what we're seeing in the world today, of course, we're, we're looking in the world today and we're seeing so much um, unrest um, internationally and individually we're seeing so much um, yeah, struggle um, and it almost feels as though life should be beautiful in the world. Our individual life should be beautiful, but we almost have these blocks which seem to be um, impeding that beauty of life. And so I often share with people, Einstein, he said, you can't solve the problems of the world with the same type of thinking that created them. And I guess that would be 
one of the messages, strong messages that I try to share with whoever I come across that when we look at the world, when we look at our individual lives, if we approach things with a material mindset, with material thinking um, that created the problems, um, continuing to do that will simply aggravate the problem even more. But what we really need to do is look at a shift in paradigm looking at our lives, looking at the world from a spiritual perspective, which can really create solutions in a much more profound and sustainable way. And so, yeah. That's... Thank you so much. And I know that the listeners are going to come, you know, come away from this with so much more um, food for thought on a lot of things. Um, and it's actually helped me, you know, massively and knowing you as well over the months has just been such an honor and a privilege. And it's, it, as I said before, it's a privilege sitting in front of you and having this chat. So I really appreciate it. And Hare Krishna. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it.